you know, Jack Canfield, one of my favorite authors that we've marketed and represented, he says, E plus R equals O. Our life is filled with events, birthdays, anniversary, deaths, celebrations, milestones, success, failure. All these are events. A flight is an event. Everything is an event. COVID-19, to some extent, is an event. The question is, how do you respond to each event that life presents to you? What do you attribute as their success mantra? What do they do behind the scenes that none of us are privy to? They ask themselves one question every day, which is what I do as well. Which is, what new value can I bring my clients what new value can I bring my team? What new value can I bring to the global audiences? My dear listeners, welcome back to Inspire Someone Today, your channel for amplifying inspiration. Today, I am breaking bread with the Chief Energizing Officer of Right Selection and the much acclaimed and accomplished author of Breaking Bread. You, you heard me right. I am joined by Gautam Ganglani. Gautam, congratulations on your tremendous response to your book, Breaking Bread, and thank you for joining us today. An absolute pleasure, Shrikant, to be with you. Thank you for your warm welcome and invitation to be on your podcast. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. The pleasure is equally great for all of us and to my dear listeners, Gautam. So we'll jump right in. Tell us a bit about the book and the importance of building relations. I will not dwell into too much of it. I'll let you to kind of talk about it. So help us understand about the book and the importance of building the relationship, the why and how of it. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Srikant. To me, uh, writing Breaking Bread uh, is sort of a milestone for me because I have Firstly, represented and marketed well over 50 authors and speakers for the last 25 plus years in my journey as an entrepreneur. So when I was invited to write a book, Breaking Bread, or rather invited to write a book on relationship building, I said to myself, you know, when you write a book, you know, they always say, never judge a book by its cover. Having said that, you know, a good title is always something that catches the first intention or first interest from a prospective reader. So I was thinking, you know, when it comes to relationship building, which is sort of my passion uh, from a very young age, you know, in my teenage years, I always said, you know, it's about connecting with people. And there's a quotation and a saying that's saying that said, families that eat together, stay together. And that was really embedded in my mind from my parents, because every Sunday was sort of that family meal that you all come together, sometimes even extended family, because, you know, dad's at work, you know, mom's got her own commitments, kids are in school, cousins are here and there. But coming together every week was something that we grew up with as a sort of culture of eating together, sharing our food, sharing stories of the week. And I would say that is what triggered the title called Breaking Bread. When you sort of do a Google search on Breaking Bread, Breaking Bread is where, you know, it goes back to sort of bread and water if you take it to that level. But the definition of breaking bread really is about when a meal, be it breakfast, lunch, dinner, between two or more people, that's when you're sort of breaking bread. Uh, I take it to the next level and say it's an emotional connect when you sort of connect emotionally with another person, be it your family member, be it a team member, be it a customer. That's something special and unique about food. As we know, when you have a meal, that's sort of a very personal space. It could be a cultural mean. So Breaking Bread's foundation was about relationship building. The title Breaking Bread was sort of the words that represent having a meal with another person. And that's really what was the triggers of writing this book and the sort of the why of writing this book. And very briefly, and obviously we can elaborate as per your interest, but basically the book really shares practical inspirational ideas of how I have broken bread, not only with my team, with my customers, but even global thought leaders. Many people would meet some of these great names, Deepak Chopra, Robin Sharma, Marshall Goldsmith, Stephen Covey, Brian Tracy, just one time in their lives would be like a, a great achievement to have spent quality time. But they've all been and I say this with humbleness and respect, they've all been home for dinner. And to me, when you represent and market them, inviting them for a home-cooked meal, your home is the most personal space in your life, in my life. And if you can have a meal with 
a thought leader in your home, they sort of become extended family or some would say professional friends. So that's really sort of a high level overview and a concept of breaking bread, the philosophy. And uh, yeah, that's a pleasure to share that with you. For a boy who was bullied at school to representing some of these world-class uh, speakers and you yourself running a fantastic organization, give us the insights of what went to what went into building those relationships and how did you take it to the level that it is today? Thanks, Srikant. You, you touched upon sharing the bullying sort of experience and I feel it's important to share that story and the context because it definitely played a role in helping me become who I am today. It certainly helped me in understanding the importance of relationships. And also, I want people to realize there's always a story behind a story that in every man or woman's success, they've all had their times of vulnerability. They've all had their pains. They've all had their challenges. No one is exempt from that. You know, it's about how you respond to that. So I share it because I know there would be others who've been through similar challenges. So, you know, at the age of 13, I was sort of born and brought up in London, UK firstly. But at the age of 13, I went through a very difficult three years where I was bullied, I was teased, I was humiliated, I was made fun of. And it was a very discomfortable feeling. You sort of felt vulnerable, you felt stressed, you felt anxiety, and you felt alone. And uh, you know, my self-esteem was on all-time low. My confidence was had taken a beating. And ultimately, your grades in your school were below average. And that was a wake-up call, which is when I went to my dad and I said, you know, Papa, nothing makes any sense. I'm confused. I'm lost. I feel alone. You know, these boys at school keep teasing me. And uh, for various reasons, I just feel very discomfort, uh, a lot of discomfort. He said, Son, I'm going to give you three pieces of advice. And before I do that, I want to share with you that there are two things that are constant in life. So I said, what is that, Papa? He said, two things that are constant in your life, whether you're a teenager, you're in your 20s, 30s, 50s, even till my age, ex no one exempt, is change and challenges. Every one of us will always face change and challenges. You know, if there's one wake-up call we've all had in the last couple of years is COVID-19, call it, you know, one, two, three. I mean, how many waves we've had, you know, a lost count. But at the end of the day, everyone globally, no matter how successful you are, how much of a celebrity you are, you know, no one on this earth, any country, everyone was exposed. Everyone was vulnerable. We were all one sort of race, one Sort of unit and you realize that that was the biggest change and challenges that everyone went through so we all have our you know covid situation it could be relationship issues it could be financial issues it could be personal issues health issues challenges exist all the time the question is how do you respond to the challenges you know jack canfield one of my favorite authors that we've marketed and represented he says e plus r equals o our life is filled with events Birthdays, anniversary, deaths, celebrations, milestones, success, failure. All these are events. A flight is an event. Everything is an event. COVID-19, to some extent, is an event. The question is, how do you respond to each event that life presents to you? When you're successful, do you respond with an ego? When you're successful, do you respond with integrity, humbleness, authenticity? How you respond to success determines the outcome. People are attracted to you like a magnet or people are repelled by you because you've got an ego. In the same way, when you go through a difficult time, be it health, be it financial, the challenges of COVID, how did you respond? I asked myself, what can I learn from this situation? You know, how do I upskill myself? How do I embrace technology? What more value can I add to my clients who have even more pain than me? I started asking myself better questions. And so the pandemic to me was, you know, something I'm very grateful for, not to take away what people have gone through, but by God's grace, I'd say, what did I learn? You know, I hosted over a hundred webinars. I, you know, connected with more people. We had visibility. We had clients across borders. So lots of positive. We built a brand new business model by force. And today that model is sustainable in an offline or online world. You know, so really how you respond determines your outcome. You know, so E plus R 
equals O. Event plus response equals outcome. Now, coming to my dad's advice, he said, you know, once you've accepted that change and challenge are constant, there are three pieces of advice. Firstly, surround yourself with the right people. People who uplift you, encourage you, inspire you, help you be the best version of yourself. That is absolutely key. There's a saying that pe- the five most people you spend time with is a direct correlation to your success, your wealth. So surround yourself with the right people. Secondly, continuously learn. Learning is a lifetime journey. Mahatma Gandhi said, stop learning, stop living. To me, I mean, whether you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, my parents have had to embrace technology in their 60s and 70s in this COVID time. You know, we had people who were never using technology in this up till their 70s. And today they embrace technology because they wanted to stay connected with their families. So you have to continuously learn. The mobiles have evolved from what they were. TVs have evolved. Business has evolved. So you have to continuously learn so that you are relevant and up to date. And then third and most importantly is take action. Take massive action. You know, you can read the best books. You can attend great seminars. You can listen to podcasts. You can watch YouTube videos. But if you don't take action, it's, you know, it adds no value. It's actually negative because, you know, there's a saying to know and not to do is not yet to know, you know, that is really about we can know things. But if you don't take action, it's meaningless. In summary, my dad says, surround yourself with the right people, continuously learn and take action. If you apply these three strategies in your life, whether you're going through a success or challenge, you will succeed. You will have happiness. You will have fulfillment because you're focusing on the solution. You're focusing on the breakthrough. You're focusing on what can I learn from this? You're focusing on what next? You're focusing on how you can progress. You're not dwelling on why did this happen? Whose fault is it? You know, I'm so unlucky. All of this negative self-talk that some people go through. So I know that was a sort of long-winded response, but I hope it added value to the conversation. Thanks, Srikant. No, absolutely. Those are some wonderful words of wisdom from your dad passing on to the generation and you in turn sharing it with all of us. So appreciate that. Thank you. To a very large extent uh, in your book, you also touch upon the importance of relationship building, importance of networking, right? And networking, uh, like it or not, also has a myth around it is a lot of networking gets done for personal gains rather than for the uh, what's in it for the other person. So from that con- contrast of uh, what networking can be or should be to what it has become, what would be your recommendation to making the best out of networking so that you don't come across as, okay, you're here to personal gains only? No, it's a fantastic question, Srikant. And, you know, there are many people out there. So networking, if not done correctly, can be seen as transactional, can be seen all about business, can be seen in the wrong light. You know, but networking to me is relationship building. You know, to me, if you attend an event, there are, you know, people, one extreme networking is someone who's got a hundred business cards and goes out and just gives out as many business cards as possible. So that is one form of networking where you're just hunting, as some people say, versus farming. I go to an event, what's my strategy? There could be 100, 200, 500 people. Yes, I may meet many people because people know me or I know them, I'll shake hands. But my goal of every event is I want to have five quality conversations. Because if I have five or more quality conversations, they will be meaningful, they will be memorable, and they will add value. Now, in that conversation, the focus is I ask some questions. Because, you know, contrary to my personality where I love speaking, to me, the person who adds value, builds relationship, builds trust, Rapport is the person who listens more. You know, they say the best networkers, you know, listen 70% and talk 30%. Again, some people saying they're talking all the time and giving no time. So, you know, I ask some questions and I just listen attentively in the presence. And the person feels, wow, Gautam, what a wonderful person. And why? Because they got to share their story. They get, they get to feel heard. They felt valued. You know, less is more. It's not about, oh, let me meet network with 100 people and shake 100 hands, get 100 cards. That's not network. That's very transactional. Networking is where you create value. You show interest in other people. 
you know, have a conversation with five to 10 people in an event is far more valuable. So it's really about being authentic, uh, being interested in other people, adding value to the other person because you build what we call an emotional bank account. When you help enough other people, then what goes around comes around. The people will be more than happy to help you because you were the first person to make that move, to build relationship, to show interest and ask, how can I help you? You did cover up on some very interesting insights here. One is importance of good networking is listening, to hear out the story, to have that kind of empathy to hear out the other person. For a lot of us, we categorize ourselves either we are extroverts or we are introverts. Right? Extroverts, talking comes naturally, so keeping quiet would be a challenge. For introverts, making that first step, first step to kind of go and have a conversation would be a biggest challenge. What would be a recommendation for both set of people? I, I think I get it for extroverts. Uh, talk less, hear more. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. O- outside of that, any recommendations that you have? Yeah, I mean, for an extrovert, as you rightly point out, he's a natural networker. He's a people's person. He loves talking. He loves meeting people. So his challenge and focus is, let me ask questions and listen more, which is for me, myself, that's the transition I've had over these last 10, 15, 20 years is, is that when it comes to an introvert, my suggestion from experience of knowing introverts is, you know, attend an event with a friend or at least find one other person that you can attend with. Because when you have one friend, and I used to do it even as an expert, extrovert, I'd say to a friend, let's go together. You know, if the event is by chance not something interesting, at least we have each other's company. That's your contingency. But on a more positive note, I'd say to them that, you know, I'd rather you speak about me and I speak about you. So when you attend an event, chatting away and you feel comfortable about speaking about your friend and vice versa. But when you attend an event, then you're two people. So you sort of your self-esteem, your confidence is a little more than when you're standing there alone. And by default, you know, for me, I'll say, I'll go get a cup of tea and I'll just simply say good morning. And, uh, you know, pleasure to meet you at this conference. You know, have you, you know, have some open ended questions, you know, with, you know, what organization are you from? Have you attended this conference before? You know, say something about the conference. So think of very simple three, four statement stroke questions that you can ask people at the tea counter over lunch, sit next to it on a table where you don't know anybody. By default, people will say, hi, what's your name? And very, very relaxed. So don't feel over-empowered that, oh my God, there's a room of 500 people here. Where do I start and stand in one corner? Go to the tea stand, have lunch with someone, discuss at your table. So find those easy sort of low-hanging fruit where there's already people at a tea stand. There's already people having lunch. There's already people uh, discussing something. And just join in the conversation that way. That would be my sort of easy suggestion. Either go with someone or just join those breaks and meet people in that way and just have two, three informal questions and you'll anyway be a great listener as an introvert. Those are very interesting, easy to do suggestions, Gautam. My pleasure. So, so in the making of breaking the bread, what was Gautam's own learning of being an author? Well, being an author, I definitely recommend everyone to be an author of something that they're passionate about. Uh, I have no immediate plans to write another book, but it certainly felt great to have in the pandemic, you know, put something that I procrastinated and I said, I'll do it later to actually put pen to paper and writing the book. It's it's a lot easier than one thought. You know, we sort of have those mindsets of this is very difficult. You know, you get, you know, partner, we partner. There are people in India internationally who will help you write the book, you know, package it for you printed publishing. So there are people out there who will help you. So to me, I'd really recommend it because to me, if I can say it, it's my best business card. I mean, when you give a business card to someone, it's just name number, they may enter it in their phone and then the card is gone, right? Now, even if you give my book to someone who doesn't read, you know, a book cannot be thrown. A book could be kept on their desk or in their library. It Every time they see the book, they remember you. Now, I went for a very short book of 100 pages with large font. So the best compliment I got is even people who don't read have read my book. And that to me was ultimate. And they said, Gotham, I haven't read a book in years. And your book was so thin and large font, it made it like, okay, let me read a few pages 
out of love and respect because Gautam sent me a copy. And they said, we just enjoyed reading it because it was stories. The font was large. It wasn't like intimidating. And the book was so thin in our hand. So that was my ultimate goal is write a, you know, even if you find it difficult, write a short book, share your story, share your experience, pay it forward. And uh, it's become my best business card. Because, you know, when you think of author, the short form is actually author stands for authority. So people see me as a relationship building authority. When you give that, it gives you instant credibility. Uh, I've been interviewed like we are today. More than 25 people have interviewed me. So when you've written a book, it gives you credibility. It gives you brand position. It gives you the positioning of being seen as an expert and you get interviewed. So to me, every touch point of writing a book has only positives in it. And it's helped indirectly opportunities in the business space because you are an entrepreneur, a business coach and an author. Fantastic. You have not only made the book easy read, I think you have also filled the book with wonderful content that somebody should pick it up and read it to realize what those wonderful content is like. Thank you. Thank you so much, Srikant. So Gautam, you represent right selection. For me, when I look at right selection, it is like a galaxy of stars out there. So while you talk about right selection, I would also want to ask you about the lineup of your speakers. What makes them great? And why are they so sought after speakers? What's the secret sauce? Thank, thanks, Srikant. Wonderful question again, because I'm asked this question by every aspiring speaker, author, trainer that out there. Like Gautam, you're working with some of the world's best speakers. You know, can you also represent us? Now, I love to be helpful. And if I can't directly help someone, I would refer them. And they say, Gautam, you know, how do we become a speaker that you'd consider representing? Or how do we become as successful as the speakers that you work with? And the book is definitely a great stepping stone. But, you know, ultimately, it's your marketing strategy to build your personal brand as an author, as a speaker. Because if I look at myself as a speaker agency, you know, whether you have event agencies, speaker agencies, companies, associations, conference organizers who need speakers, why should they select you as a speaker? Is because you're marketable. Either you're marketable or you're an industry expert who has got a very strong knowledge in a particular niche, then they're hiring you for two reasons. If they're hiring you because of your expertise, it's because the value of your expertise will help their team grow the business or solve a problem. So either you're an industry expert or you are a, I won't necessarily say celebrity, but you are a micro celebrity in the context that if I bring you for my event, for my company, or I bring you for a conference. When I say Gotham is hosting Marshall Goldsmith or Robin Sharma or Simon Sinek or you know Gary Kirsten or any eminent personality, people will prioritize their time to come for that event. Even a company says, when we tell our employees, come for this one-hour talk at this date and this time, virtually or in person, their employees are saying, why do I have to attend? even though they're being invited and they're not paying. So we need to make it compelling or we need to make it marketable. So it needs to be something like, oh my God, I'd love to see Robin Sharma or Marshall Goldsmith or Stephen Covey in person for a one-hour event. You know, So it becomes something that gives them, to some extent it's edutainment, to some extent it's learning, it's the excitement of getting a photograph or a sign book, you know. And it's exactly what I'm doing now. I mean, we have, you know, Marshall Goldsmith's book has just arrived called The Earned Life. He's he's coming in. This is an advanced copy. He's coming in to India in three weeks' time, the Gulf and India. And my goal is I've got an event in Hyderabad with over a thousand delegates where they'll be all getting a copy of his book. That's the whole thing. He'll speak for an hour, a thousand delegates, and a thousand books will be there in their hands. Now, that becomes 1,000 prospects who want to engage Marshall Goldsmith. So the book plays a role, brand positioning, having a book in the right hands, and ultimately being marketable. And again, with your association with a lot of these speakers, what do you attribute as their success mantras? What do they do behind the scenes that none of us are privy to? They ask themselves one question every day, which is what I do as well, which is what new value can I bring my clients what new value can I bring my team? What new value can I bring to the global audiences? Because 
as long as you're asking yourself, what new value can I bring? Your mind is thinking very affirmatively to enhancing the loyalty of your existing fans. If I'm an author and I have just a hundred people who got my book, so I have a hundred people. Now, my thing is, what new value can I bring hundred people? Now, when I make hundred people, as Ken Blanchard says, from fans to raving fans. Now, your raving fans who appreciate the value you brought them become your secondary sales team, become your referral marketers, become your word of mouth, you know, marketers. So that 100 becomes 200, becomes 400, becomes 800, and it compounds over time. Even if you've got five fans, you know, as simple as five to 10 to 15 to 20. So whether it's in person, whether it's on social media, Instagram or LinkedIn, I mean, I'll give you a classic example for myself. I mean, in the beginning of the pandemic, I had 5,400 LinkedIn followers. At the end of the pandemic, I had 21,250 followers. So I've gone from roughly 5,000 to 20,000 in 24 months by wanting, by only adding value on LinkedIn, not selling anything, just sharing valuable content, ideas, insights on LinkedIn by adding value. That's LinkedIn. You can do that in the physical world. Marshall Goldsmith has written 100 books. Only three of them became global bestsellers or rather four. He's still writing books. He's turning 75 now. And he's writing a book on the earned life, which is about living life with happiness and fulfillment, how to create a legacy. He's still adding value at age 75. He's coming to India and we've got clients booking him, even though he's been coming for 20 years. I mean, they could be asking me, Gautam, bring me a new speaker. But Marshall is bringing new value. Every year, he says, my commitment is one new book every year. So all my fans will continuously come back for what new value I'm bringing them. And they'll bring their friends that I've been a fan of Marshall Goldsmith for five years. He's got a brand new book. Join me at this next event. So his loyal fans, raving fans will bring new people who become fans. And then it's just organic growth. So it's offline, online, in any format. What new value can you bring your client? I think that's the magic's uh, wand. This adding value, creating value is what drives the path towards success. Absolutely, Srikant. So, Gautam, we've been talking about networking, relationship building, and how you went about creating your own organization. We'll slightly take a detour and jump into a section of this conversation called as the power of three round. The first of the power of three round, three routines that is unique to Gautam. My morning routine is that it's an hour of self-care every single morning. Um, every night is a gratitude journal. So I write what was I was grateful for from the day. And uh, the third one would be with every meal, I make sure there's no mobile at the table. Nice. Three dream speakers you would like to have on board. <laughs> Not that you don't have fantastic dream speakers, but again, I, we are I, all crazy I, for I'd more. I certainly love to have officially Barack Obama on board. To me, he's a... Just a wonderful speaker who I'd love to sort of host and represent. Simon Sinek as well. I mean, his books have done resoundingly well for a number of years. And the third one would probably be Malcolm Gladwell. You know, Tipping Point, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Outliers. So his Outliers. Three, three. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Nice list. Three things on your bucket list, Gautam. Three things on my bucket list. One is to do the safari uh, in East Africa, which is something I'd like to do with my family. Uh, I'd love to watch a test match, uh, Boxing Day test match, or watch a cricket game at uh, in Australia, the Gabba or any Australian ground, just to visit Australia and watch the cricket. And um, I guess the third would be, I guess, a cruise with my family. What are the three insights that you have developed over the years to your association at Right Selection? Uh, the three things I would say that, you know, relationships are absolutely critical. That's one. I've learned immense patience. And thirdly, I think is discipline because you've got to have the discipline, you know, to do the right things consistently um, to achieve success. Okay. The last of the power of three round, Gautam. What are the three attributes of a good speaker? Energy, humor, mm-hmm. and storytelling. Wonderful. 
Great. That brings us to the close of the power of three round. Thanks for that, Gautam. My pleasure, Srikant. Before we slip into the next section, I just wanted to check on one thing that you mentioned in the power of three round, Gautam, which was the three routines that you follow and the power of gratitude, the gratitude journal that you write. Little more insights on that. How has it benefited? How has it helped you? In my conversation with a lot many people, they say that, okay, we hear a lot many people talk about gratitude journal, but we don't know what it has done to uh, to them. Maybe if you can just elaborate on that particular piece, the benefit of it, how do you go about writing it and how have you seen that helping you in your own uh, career? Sure, Shrika. Actually, I've also heard of gratitude journal for a number of years. I've stopped, started. In fact, one friend of mine, Malti Bojwani, based in Singapore, as a gratitude journal, she gifted me. That was my first experience many years ago. I did it for probably 100 days and then I stopped. But more recently in the pandemic, it gave me a chance to really look at things which I've done in my life, which I've not done consistently and realizing that, you know, you go through a fitness routine, you meditate, you do yoga, you do journaling, you do a lot of things which give you happiness and fulfillment, but you just stop and start. I came across a book called Don't Just Exist. Come Alive by Meher Mirchandani. So after reading half the book, the second half of the book was a journal. And it said, you know, just take 15 minutes a day to write down, you know, your three things you're most grateful for, uh, the person you need to forgive, three things that you're grateful for in different areas of your life. And what I found is that when you put pen to paper, it really helps cement that we have so much to be grateful for. Because Every one of our days, we can plan our days, but as you and I know, we can plan our days, but there are things that are going to happen that are going to disrupt your days. You could change your mood. You could suddenly be unwell. You could suddenly be irritated. You could be stressed. There could be many issues that happen there that change your mood. So when you come to the gratitude journey and you write, despite all the drama, all the noise, all the problems and challenges that each of us go through in different times of our lives, I need to be grateful for what I have and not about what I don't have. And so it just helps you remain grounded, helps you be authentic and helps you sort of stay stable and appreciative of life. Because otherwise, in your mind, in your busy mind, you've got a lot of positive and negative thoughts. So if we need to let go of someone by forgiving them, let's put pen to paper. I forgive so and so. If it's something I am grateful for the things in my life, which sometimes you take for granted. So just the point of, I think it helps you to press pause. It helps you to reflect. It helps you to share appreciation to the universe. And it sends a positive message to your mindset that despite the drama, stay grounded, stay appreciative. Because if you're only grateful for what you have, you have the space and capacity to attract anything new. Because if you're not grateful for what you have, you have no space to attract anything new in your life. That's been my experience of journey. Wonderful. I love that statement. Despite the drama, stay grounded. How true and how little we do in your day-to-day chaos. My question to you is, what can listeners take out of being in a speaking engagement? What can they take the best out of listening, be it a podcast, be, be it a talk? Say that, okay, I listen to Marshall and this is something that resonates with me and they go back and start practicing, start implementing some of those things. What, what are some of those practices that listeners can take away from? Wonderful uh, observation and question, uh, Srikant. And as I shared, one of my dad's advice, the third one is, you know, continuously, well, second one is continuously learning. The third one is take action, take massive action. Mm-hmm. As I said, if we use, be it Marshall Goldsmith, Ron Kaufman, Stephen Covey, every one of them has stories experiences that they are sharing with us to me i keep a blank paper you know may have the notebook when i'm listening to the question your brain goes to a very good state of mind when you are in a room you're surrounded by right people first of all people who go to events like marshall goldsmith's event or stephen covey are people who are hungry to learn willing to improve it's very unlikely you'll get someone who's negative and uh, in an event because those people will have other things. They would say, this is not worth my time. People who make time to learn are people of a certain mindset. So firstly, you're surrounding yourself with people who are inspiring, encouraging, uplifting, willing to learn, people who've got an open mindset. So that's step one. Secondly, you're learning. Now, everyone will take different things because everyone's in a different place. Someone's a startup. 
someone's uh, established in the business, someone's looking to create, so everyone's got different challenges. So everyone will take, will be listening to the speaker. And when you resonate with something that clicks in your mind, you put pen to paper and write down those ideas. As what I call them is actionable ideas. So what are the actionable ideas? You put pen to paper. And then post the event, what I do of an event, I look at what are the ideas that I can apply now? What are the ideas I can apply in some time? And what are the ideas I need to budget for or plan for? And I just put those down on a paper and then I share it with my team. Because once you write it down, plan it, importance is to share it. When you share it, you're then sending a message to your team or the universe that, you know, these are ideas I took away. When you share something, it gets reinforced and the chances of it happening are higher because your team is going to support you to make it happen. So that's the context behind it. Okay. So if there's one call for action for all of our listeners listening to this particular podcast is note down one action item coming out of this particular podcast, go back and implement it. Absolutely and right, Srikant. Absolutely right. Like, like you said earlier on uh, going back to your dad's principles, the last step is you might great, listen to great speakers, but you don't take action. There's no point in uh, listening to that. Yeah, there's another quote, strategy without execution is no strategy at all. It's like mm. that quote that I shared earlier, to know and not to do is not yet to know, not to. you know. You know, I mean, in fact, another way of explaining what we've just spoken about is that people tell, you know, that when you attend an event, we don't know what we don't know or what we say, we are unconsciously ignorant. Now, when you attend an event, you're going to learn something new. So now your unconscious unawareness of the importance of that topic. Now you are aware. So now that awareness should drive you, engage you, compel you to go and take action. Because when you create action, you create a new value. When you create new value, you get you know new results. And that's how things move and things shift. Right. And the other element to this, Gautam, is again, the last two years has been fantastic in terms of learning, in terms of new content. You have far more access to things that you didn't have. Sure. With that is also the deluge of overloading of information right yes. all of us are indaunted with information how do you draw how do you draw a line between how much is too much that's a good question <laughs> how much is too much yeah i mean i definitely if i look at myself i look at one book to read per month i know people who read a book a week i know people read one book a, a year there's no wrong or right i feel make sure you don't feel overwhelmed you know, don't feel you're stressed by learning. You know, even I would recommend I read 15 minutes a day. You know, that's it. 15, 20 minutes a day. Don't feel, oh, I have to read an hour a day and over push myself. I'd rather do 15 minutes a day consistently than one hour. It's like going to the gym. Like when do you know enough is enough? I mean, if you're going to go and work out like two hours once a week or you're going to work out 30 minutes every day, the 30 minutes every day, so it's about doing small things consistently rather than overwhelming, overburdening, and pressurizing yourself. So every one of us has our own capacity. The main thing is to do something, small, medium, or large, but do something every day, something every week that moves the needle in terms of your journey of learning. But at no time do you want it to be overwhelming or burdening. If you feel pressured, then reduce that. But do something small consistently would be my advice. Great, great advice there. Gautam, it's been... Great having a chat with you from breaking bread to all elements of speaking and listening. Uh, appreciate you taking time and joining us today. Before we wrap it up, this show is all about creating ripples of inspiration. So if there is Inspire Someone Today message for all of our listeners, what is Gautam's Inspire Someone Today message? My inspirational words of wisdom for each one of you is add emotion whenever you communicate with every person that you interact with, whether it's family, whether it's your team, whether it's your customer. Emotion and energy are the driving factors to help people progress, move, achieve things, you know? And I, to me, that is most important. And I need to probably give an example, which I'd like to do if I may. Uh, you know, when you wish people happy birthday, simple thing, be it a customer, a team member, I mean, you get umpteen. You look at Facebook. I had 500 wishes of happy birthday, but I only remember 15 of them. Now you might ask, 15 out of 500 is because those 15 people, they added emotion in their wishes. Either they called me, they sent me a voice note, they sent me a video message, 
They sent me a photograph with the wishes or they wrote a personalized message. They added meaning. They added emotion in that communication. Then just say, happy birthday, Gautam. I mean, that is like basic. Same thing on WhatsApp. Happy birthday, Gautam. I got 50 WhatsApp messages. Happy birthday, Gautam. I remember only three of them because three of them sent a, either a video, a picture or a voice note. So when you communicate with emotion, when you communicate with energy, you are memorable. When you are memorable, you're adding value. You're being thought about in people's minds. And that's what is absolutely critical, not about only results, but to have more happiness and fulfillment in when you communicate with people. So be it email, be it WhatsApp, be it social media. When you communicate, commu- communicate with energy and emotion would be my key statement to you. Communicate with energy and emotion. Those are the parting words from Gautam. Gautam, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your wonderful words of wisdom. I hope our listeners will take this and go back and start breaking bread. Thank you so much, Srikan. It's been an absolute pleasure and privilege to be on your podcast. I really enjoyed our conversation today. And I trust for those who have the pleasure of listening to this podcast can find some value and take action in their lives. Thank you for listening into today's edition of Inspire Someone Today. It's been a privilege to bring in these conversations. If you like this episode and have any feedback or comments, do mail me at inspire someone today podcast at the rate gmail.com. Inspiring someone is like creating ripples around us. If you like what to listen, feel free to share them and let's create ripples of inspiration. Do not forget to follow me on my Instagram handle at the rate inspire someone today podcast for all the latest updates. This is Srikanth, your host, signing off. And until next time, keep inspiring.